So welcome, my name is Robert Winters, president of the McGill Community for Lifelong Learning. I would like to welcome you to part three of this groundbreaking lecture series that marks a new collaboration between MCLL and the McGill University Retiree Association, or MIRA. Before we start today's session, I would like to remind everybody that McGill University is on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. We acknowledge and thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose presence marks this territory on which peoples of the world now gather. I would like to introduce Dr. Antti Pajan, President of MIRA, who has been crucial in helping build MCLL's relationship with his important group representing retired McGill employees. At McGill since 1976, Antti is a professor in pharmacology and therapeutics. He has done research in neuroscience, pharmacology, therapeutics, and also clinical research on alcoholism. And he also hears of manage patient care in intensive care units and in medical education. He's the founder and director of E. Medici de McGill, an orchestra that plays classical music with a professional conductor. The next concert is a benefit for people suffering from the war in Ukraine on May 19. And he has organized this series of presentations on behalf of our two organizations. Today's session is the third, and the remaining two are not to be missed. Well, thank you, Robert, uh, very kind words. And I believe it's um, one of the uh, very important aspects of being in a big school that people from different parts of the, or different activities in the school uh, collaborate uh, in, producing such things of general interest. Mm -hmm. I'm, oh, I'm uh, just um, expressing appreciation uh, for a great collaboration with MCLL. Uh, this is the second or third time we are doing something like that together. And of course, I'm particularly pleased to have such a um, uh, outstanding uh, scientist and clinician and colleague as uh, Dr. Turetsky uh, joining, uh, uh, providing us with his insight experience in one very um, difficult topic in human existence, and that is suicide. People that decide to finish with this life in a dramatic way. Uh, Dr. Turetsky is a psychiatrist and um, researcher at the Douglas Center. He's originally from Brazil and came 1984. And right now is a chair of the Department of uh, Psychiatry at McGill and director of a group that is dealing with suicide and depression. And I think there's a number of other things that he's doing. Perhaps I would just focus on his main topic, uh, which is uh, perhaps the best ex uh, expressed as uh, how the experience uh, affects uh, brain function. This is a big topic that is, uh, has uh, uh, placed the epigenetic effects or mechanisms in the center of a completely different way of looking at the interaction between experience and genes. In particular, he has shown with two colleagues, two other colleagues at McGill, that the early experience affects, among other things, um, risks for suicide in later life. I won't go any further except to say that uh, this work has been recognized by a whole list. I have a whole page of uh, awards that uh, Dr. Turetsky received. The last one is Colvin Prize in Mood Disorders. He uh, is, uh, uh, he got one uh, um, Montreal, oh, sorry, McGee, uh, Quebec um, 
important prize, Leo Parizeau Prize, uh, Aquas, and I see that he also got Joel Elkis uh, Prize. Uh, Elkis was, uh, never mind, he was an important in my life, but that's not important for this talk. Um, rather than going through this list, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Turetsky to give us some important points on this topic on suicide and life experience. So I uh, I sort of prepare a general talk on suicide and suicidal behaviors. You know, we can discuss on specific aspects. If you're interested to better understand, you know, I can uh, get into details of uh, some of the work that we do. But I thought that what you wanted was more sort of an overview. And so that's, um, that's what uh, we're going to uh, talk about today. So when um, we talk about suicide and suicidal behaviors, we have to understand that you know there's um, there's a spectrum of uh, behaviors that are part of the uh, so uh, you know so-called continuum of suicidal behavior. So from one end, the most extreme uh, behavior, it's 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 clearly uh, suicide, um, you know, or death by suicide. Um, here. But you have uh, a number of other behaviors and uh, also um, phenomena that uh, are related to societal behavior, like, uh, you know, obviously the attempts or um, thinking about suicide that can be either active suicidal thoughts when we are um, thinking and planning uh, something in particular, or more passive su uh, suicidal thoughts, which are when we don't, you know, we wish we were dead, but uh, we don't have any particular plan or 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 specific ideas about doing anything about ending our lives. And then you have uh, non-suicidal self-injury, which is um, uh, behaviors that patients sometimes engage uh, uh, in, like um, um, cutting themselves, and that it's uh, not necessarily without a intent to die, but it's mostly. Um, a present as a form to uh, release um, uh, emotional pain. So we see this very often, for instance, among teenagers or uh, young um, uh, young adults that are um, engaged in, in in cutting themselves or hurting themselves, and that often uh, takes place when they are going through very difficult um, uh, emotional experiences. So so this is what you know, we um, uh, consider as part of this suicide uh, spectrum. Now, just to give you an idea of the relationship between them, um, is that, you know, a lot of people actually think about suicide. So suicidal thoughts are, are quite common. Um, and, uh, you know, if you look uh, into the, uh, um, Sort of the natural history uh, of, you know, of suicidal behavior, if we can say so, or if you look at development, you would see that there are periods in life, for instance, during uh, a late adolescence, where up to ten percent of people would have some sort of thoughts about uh, about uh, suicide. So, suicidal ideation is it's you know it's it's very common. Um, suicide attempts um, are less common. Uh, but yet much more common that actually um, die by suicide. So that gives you right away a perspective that, um, you know, when we in psychiatry try often to assess people uh, to prevent this little point here, yes, but what are the tools that we use to prevent this little dot here, it's basically assessing suicidal ideation and suicide attempts. So, you know, you would often see and read in the newspapers, let's say, about individuals that presented to the emergency room with uh, uh, suicidal uh, suicidal thoughts, and then they are discharged, and then they end up uh, dying. And the reason is that um, when we assess people, it's very difficult for us to um, precisely identify these individuals here when assessing all of these individuals, yes? So that gives you a perspective of the difficulty in the work um, of uh, predicting suicide, you know, suicide 
by uh, um, by doing clinical assessment. So a lot of the work that we have been doing over the years is precisely to better understand these these individuals here. Yes, to better understand what they are, what are uh, um, you know what are the characteristics both at the uh, clinical level and the uh, biological level in a way so that one day we can be more uh, precise um, in the identification of these individuals uh, here when um, we're doing assessments. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, the, uh, uh, you know, the frequency of, um, of particularly suicide. So most of the talk is going to focus on suicide. Yes. So, so yeah, about a million people die by suicide worldwide uh, per year. You know, so it's it's really it's it's quite something to think that more people die by suicide per year than in all wars combined. Yes, and yet you know we always think and rightly so about wars and uh, and try to prevent them, etc. But suicide, you know, it's it's even though you know we are all aware of and uh, talk about this, relatively speaking, we do very little about it. Yes, and that's why. Um, and we are very little aware of that, you know, the magnitude of the problem. So that's why, you know, like uh, many years ago, um, there was a, a series of articles published in in, in the uh, Ottawa Citizen that that basically uh, referred to suicide as the quiet epidemic in the sense that, you know, it's such a magnitude, it has such an impact in, in our society, and yet, you know, we do very little about it. Um, and and particularly so because it's you know it, it is it is in fact you know the first cause of death for individuals who are young, yes, particularly young men. So, um, where you know when you look at the distribution of suicide around the world, what you see is you know here. Um, you you know you can see by glancing at the map that you know it's not a problem that affects every every country the same way yes so there is a lot of regional variability in rates of suicide so you go from countries that like here in green and blue that have lower rates of suicide to those in red you know that have the highest uh, you know um, like uh, uh, russia and um and then other ones that are in between, like us, you know, Canada, that um, suicide rates are um, somewhere in the middle. Um, so in Canada, we have about 4,000 suicide deaths uh, per year. Um, it is uh, worldwide, more men die by suicide than women. It's about, you know, it varies from country to country, but between two and five times more men than, than women, with the exception um, of rural China. But that used to be the case, you know, it's sort of reverting, where uh, the rates are about one to one. And we can talk about this, you know, if we have time, um, why that's the case. Uh, now, on the other hand, women attempt suicide more than men, about three to four. Uh, and are more likely to be hospitalized because of that. Yet, um, so as I said, uh, you know, the thinking about suicide, having suicide ideation, uh, it's frequent. You know, uh, it is quite frequent in the general population, and uh, attempts are also quite frequent. You know, it's um, about three percent of the, uh, of individuals have um, uh, attempted suicide in their lifetime. Um, and uh, now, when you look at uh, um, uh, you know the distribution of uh, suicide, you see that uh, you know the ages are um, it's middle age. You know, it's the it's really where most of the suicides take place. So here you have a distribution in uh, among the provinces. Uh, so you see here, Quebec, uh, it's not the highest. Uh, it does vary uh, from, you know, from um, uh, over time. You know, right now, uh, Saskatchewan has the highest rate, or that's the from the last uh, stats that we have. 
you know, but there were periods where Quebec, you know, when I began my career, Quebec had the highest rates of suicide in Canada. So it does, you know, vary. Suicide does vary over time. And uh, so here you, you can see, and it does vary over time everywhere, you know, uh, around the world. Uh, there is variability in the rates of suicide over time, and there is marked variability um, in uh, over time and in the region. So for instance, here you have distribution of suicides over time in the different provinces of uh, Canada. Um, and, uh, but, you know, but here you would see this is in relationship with the territories, yes? So you see, for instance, in Nunavut, uh, the rates of suicide are way, way higher than in Canada here in blue, yes? So these are the averages, uh, you know, in Canada, it's about 10 per 100,000. Whereas in, in Nunavut, it's, you know, from, uh, it's almost a hundred, depending on the period, almost a hundred uh, per a hundred thousand. So, you know, it's 10 times higher than the average in, in, in Canada. So when you only look at a rate of suicide per country, you really don't see those, um, the, the, the regional variability. So in fact, you know, in Nunavut, we have one of the highest rates of suicide in the world. Um, right here, you know, so we spent, for instance, uh, seven years, uh, about 15 years ago, doing um, doing a study of suicide in, in Nunavut that, uh, you know, we can talk uh, later on uh, if we have time. So, you know, how do we understand suicide and suicide risk? Yes, so this is um, a sort of model that we proposed um, a few years ago, you know, to try to understand you know, why is that um, people die by suicide? So suicide is obviously a complex behavior. Um, it's not, so you cannot um, reduce it to a single factor. Uh, the way we understand is that individuals who die by suicide have a given predisposition here, um, you know, uh, by these, um, uh, given by factors, you know, that act more distally, so to speak, you know, that are not, related to the um, to the behavior itself uh, temporarily yet but there are um, that that basically increase predisposition yet so among these factors we would have uh, factors like family history genetics uh, um, life events you know early on in life and so on and so forth that shape up the individual and that confer, a um, given predisposition, then, you know, all these factors would lead to um, a development, you know, behavioral development of these individuals, you know, that uh, interact and live in particular, you know, in, in, in their environment. And then uh, on the other end, you have um, factors that act more proximately to, um, to, the, uh, to this reside, you know, temporarily, and that act as precipitated. Yet, so where do you have that? You have, you know, um, I think chief among them is it's really psychopathology is the mental illness that it's uh, frequently, you know, present in the vast majority of the cases of suicide, not to say all of them, um, that with psychopathology brings, you know, uh, alterations in the perception of the reality, uh, a lot of hopelessness, etc. Psychopathology often associates as well with life events, with the, uh, that act as triggers and precipitate, you know, um, the uh, the illness. And then with the illness, you know, you have suicidal ideation that leads to suicide. So that's that's sort of the model at the individual level. Yes, would we think about okay, what leads one individual um, and 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 uh, and uh, to die by suicide? But then the individuals don't live in a vacuum. They live, you know, we all live in societies. Our societies go through process, through, through periods, periods where risk factors may be more or less frequent. And in, you know, to some degree that accounts for variability over time as well as variability over regions. Yes, so that social environment is what determines uh, the other part of the risk um, that uh, uh, whether that's social support, uh, um, uh, or not, you know, economic problems and uh, many other ones 
uh, that um, may be at play. So let's talk a little bit about this, this in these different factors in a bit more detail. Yeah. So first about you know the uh, the distal factors that act more distally, you know, increasing predisposition. And so you know this picture here is just to remind me to talk about familial aggregation of suicide or uh, familial clustering of suicide because. You know, this, this uh, boy here is who later on grew up to uh, become a very famous writer, it's Ernst, Ernst uh, Hemingway, you know, who it's, um, um, you know, very famous for what he wrote, but uh, also you may know that he died by suicide, but not only he died by suicide, several members of his family also died by suicide. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a well-known, um, family for to illustrate the fact that suicide does aggregate in families and aggregates in families, so clusters in families um, and uh, studies have uh, helped us uh, um, also show that this familial aggregation of suicide, it, it is uh, independent of uh, the familial aggregation for psychopathology. So this is um, a study done um, many years ago in the uh, in the Amish, um, and that you know the Amish uh, had very good family records, as you know, it's very traditional uh, um, community that um, have lots of um, big extended families and. And they didn't have many suicides, you know, uh, in their history, you know, in, in, in Pennsylvania, where they and for the 150 years or so that they had records, and um, they had a few suicides. But interestingly enough, all of the suicides that they had, they cluster in uh, four families and um, and four extended families, and that uh, whereas there were many other families that um, had also mental illness like uh, depression and bipolar disorder that often associate with suicide, but all of these suicides, in fact, were seen in these four families. So, so that was one of the first observations that, um, that suggested that first suicide, it's um, uh, clusters in families and uh, so associated with mental illness, but it's not explained by mental illness because, um, uh, or at least not this familial clustering of suicide. Yes, because many other families also cluster mental illness and did not have cases of suicide. So, so that led to a lot of genetic studies and we're still looking for um, genes that may uh, help explain uh, this familial aggregation of suicidal behavior, um, we haven't found, but there are interesting uh, leads, um, and I'm not going to talk about this today. You know, if you're interested, we can uh, we can um, set up another talk where we can um, talk about this in more detail. But what may explain this familial aggregation of suicide that? Uh, um, comes together, but it's at the same time independent of psychopathology. And so it, it's, you know, I don't personally think that there are genes that make people die by suicide, but there are genes that um, may uh, lead to behaviors or lead to other um, factors that increase risk of suicidal behavior. And among these are um, behaviors like impulsive aggressive uh, behaviors. So a lot of studies that we have done and other people have done have suggested that when you look at individuals who die by suicide, they're more likely to uh, be more impulsive and have um, and and have aggressive traits, but particularly this in combination with impulsivity. So we call these impulsive aggressive traits. And uh, so uh, this is a very consistent finding that, you know, uh, doesn't matter how we look at this, you know, it always comes, um, even after we control for, for psychopathology and for any other uh, factors. So for instance, here looking at individuals who die by suicide uh, in the context of an episode of major depressive disorder, and 
individuals who have major depressive disorder but did not have histories of suicidal behavior, what we see is there's a marked difference in, uh, in levels of uh, impulsive aggressive traits. So uh, when we look at families of individuals who die by suicide, you know, and so this is, for instance, a study we've done several years ago where we uh, look at individuals who die by suicide and had and die by suicide with, uh, uh, you know, in, in during an episode of major depression, and it, uh, and then compare them their families with individuals with the families of individuals who um, are depressed but do not have histories of suicidal behavior and individuals who are neither depressed nor have histories of suicidal behavior. And we look at the relatives, first and second degree relatives, what we see is that the relatives of individuals who died by suicide, you know, in the context of an episode of, you know, with major depressive disorder are more likely themselves to have um, depression, but also, you know, these impulsive aggressive traits that, you know, in our jargon, we call cluster B traits. So what we have shown is that the presence of these cluster B traits, you know, these impulsive aggressive behaviors explain the familial transmission of suicidal behavior. Yeah? So um, the hypothesis that we um, developed over the years is that the um, this familial aggregation of suicidal behavior, yes, it's really explained by these impulsive aggressive traits. Yes, and that these impulsive aggressive traits is really what it's part of the equation that increases the risk of suicidal behavior. Now, let's talk a little bit about another distal factor, which is early life stress. So, you know, early life stress like, for instance, uh, histories of uh, childhood um, uh, sexual abuse or physical abuse or other um, traumatic experiences early on in life are, um, are important uh, because they associate strongly with suicidal behavior. So for instance, this is a study that we've done uh, or it's a series of studies that we've done in a cohort of individuals here from Quebec. Uh, it's a cohort of uh, it's a representative cohort of the general population from Quebec um, in collaboration with Richard Tremblay at the University of Montreal that, uh, you know, Richard had uh, um, characterized, you know, done a lot of um, uh, studies trying to understand psychological development. And uh, so this is, um, you know, a, a normative cohort of children that were, uh, recruited at the age of six uh, when, you know, in, when they were in kindergarten across the province. And um, uh, the, they were followed over many years yet. So they're still followed today, so over 30 years. And so we have a lot of data on these individuals. So we, um, when we look at uh, their early life histories, you know, pre-pubertal histories, um, of uh, development, and when we see that those that had uh, adversities, you know, that uh, were either sexual abuse or physical abuse or both, compared with those that did not, are much likely to um, present, uh, think about suicide and to um, attempt suicide than uh, those that were not. So how can this adversity during childhood influence suicide risk. So this is really a key question that my lab has spent, you know, many years uh, trying to uh, investigate. So what happens? You know, why is that uh, experience and traumatic experience early on in life can lead to a lifelong increased risk of suicidal behavior? So. You know, part of the same type of studies in these cohorts provide a little bit of the clue for that. So when we look at the trajectories of these individuals and we study how they develop over time, you know, and I told you these cohorts are, you know, very helpful 
uh, because they have a wealth of data over time. So you can study really trajectories and, and how people uh, develop. You know, uh, and so when we look at individuals who were exposed to a life adversity, who were exposed to uh, sexual and, and physical abuse during childhood, what we see is that, and I'm not gonna get too much into detail, but what we see is that really what explains the relationship between having been abused early on in life and manifesting suicidal behavior, it's really uh, a few things. So one is that they have high disruptiveness, which is basically trajectories of impulsivity, aggression, and oppositional behavior, as well as high hyperactivity yet. Uh, so uh, what, you know, in, in our jargon, we call externalizing and cluster B traits, as well as high anxiousness. Yes, but particularly, uh, so being anxious, you know, in the context of uh, these externalizing traits. So that basically led us to this hypothesis, which is that um, these distal factors, yes, whether they are uh, familial, you know, and likely genetic, uh, to um, environmental, yes, like uh, the this this uh, histories of uh, traumatic experience during childhood increase suicide risk by leading to a um, differential development of personality traits, particularly those related to uh, impulsivity, aggression, and, um, and uh, all their uh, related uh, disruptive traits, and uh, uh, as well as uh, these anxiety traits. Now, the other question, that we spend uh, quite a and still spend quite a lot of time trying to better understand is that how can this adversity during childhood lead to this differential development of personality traits? So, so what happens? Yes. So what happens as a result of this negative experience that modifies how people develop? Yes. So. So why is that this negative experience lead to this differential psychological development, if you wish, you know, or personality traits? So to understand that, you know, we have to understand that our brain, you know, as our, the organ that regulates how we interact with the environment, it's plastic. Yes, so when we say that the brain is plastic, we say that the brain adapts. Yes, it constantly adapts to the environment because that's the function of the brain is to help us better be better equipped to uh, function in the particular environment in which we are. Yes, to, to equip us to better survive, you know, the environment. So it needs to constantly adapt and better adapt, you know, to the environment. Now, we know that this capacity to adapt, it is not equal through life. Yes, there are periods during which our brain is more, you know, efficient in this capacity to adapt. Yes. Uh, so we call these critical periods. Yes. So it's quite intuitive. Yes, to think that our brain, you know, adapts better early on in life. Uh, so, you know, I mean, it's, it's everybody knows, for instance, that, uh, you know, if we learn language, I don't have, or Auntie didn't have to tell you that I wasn't born here, you would have figured out anyways by my accent that English is not my first language. Yes, even though I've been speaking English for a long time. Why is that? I have an accent, yes? Well, I have an accent because I didn't learn English uh, during a period during which my brain was capable of learning English, you know, perfectly. So I still, even though I speak English, I, 
I have an accent and I make mistakes when I speak, you know, even though I try my best not to do that. Now, it's the same thing with other things. Yes, they are quite intuitive. For instance, you know, you know, we talk about the uh, music in the beginning. So it's the same thing, you know, about perfect pitch and learning instruments. You know, we are very good at learning instruments early on in life. You know, go learn piano when you are uh, 70 and you will figure it out, you know, it's pretty tough. So the brain does not have the same capacity to adapt throughout life. You know, it does learn yet, but this um, perfect capacity changes. And so these are very intuitive examples. But what we've learned as well is that there are critical periods in the regulation of behavior. And there are critical periods in the regulation of our capacity to better function socially um, uh, and regulate our emotions, like there are for language, like there are for music and for many of our senses. And so, and how at the molecular level the, this occurs? Yes, we still don't understand this fully, but in, in, in large part occurs by what collectively we refer to as epigenetic regulation, epigenetic factors. So epigenetics, the name basically says, is everything that is on top of uh, genetics, yes? So basically what epigenetic refers to are a number of different processes that regulate genetic function that are not part of the genetic code, yes? So these are not processes that we are born with. These are not processes that are in the code that we necessarily transmit to um, our kids. But there are processes that regulate the function of uh, the gene and the genome yet to help the genome uh, better adapt yet to environmental needs to help the organism uh, develop and be uh, better equipped uh, to live in a particular environment. So I'm not going to go into details, just uh, to tell you that you know there are a number of different epigenetic processes, and uh, one of which the, probably the most famous one is uh, DNA methylation, which is the addition of a methyl group um, here to a um, uh, to the DNA to commonly a cytosine, but not uh, exclusively. So the brain is a very particular organ in terms of um, epigenetic regulation because there are a number of uh, epigenetic processes that are specific or highly, I mean, maybe even not specific, but are highly abundant in the brain and uh, much more abundant than anywhere else. And so for instance, just to give you an idea, uh, um, non, you know, one type of methylation that uh, it's known as non-CPG methylation, it accumulates in neurons as the brain sort of uh, 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 creates a lot of connection between the neuron synaptogenesis. So this occurs precisely during a period of development, you know, the when when uh, children are really learning and exploring the environment and, uh, you know, before, uh, before in the prepubertal period. Yes, so there is a, a, a drastic increase of this type of uh, methylation and that we believe that, you know, this type of methylation, it's really key to help the neuron adapt and regulate and, and learn from the environmental experience. So, uh, uh, one example, you know, which is uh, um, of, of that type of uh, changes that we think can explain uh, the risk of suicide among individuals who were exposed to adversity, it's, it's, um, it, it's, it's methylation. Yes, methylation at differential, uh, at different, at, at, uh, at different uh, uh, genes that have key roles. So, um, so one one of the findings that we have now a number of years ago, and this is uh, what uh, Andy mentioned in the introduction, it's, uh, you know, is that what we uh, observed is that individuals who had a history of adversity or abuse early on in life uh, and died by suicide differently from those that did not, 
uh, have histories of abuse and also die by suicide and, and, uh, and controls had excess uh, uh, epigenetic changes here, methylations in a key area of the brain uh, that regulates how we uh, respond to stress. Yes. So this is um, in a receptor of a uh, group of uh, the, the glucocorticoid receptor in the hippocampus. And these changes in methylation, you know, this difference in methylation really uh, led to how uh, differences how this gene works. So why would that be? Yes. So why? So um, how do we make sense? You know, of of why, uh, you know, why all that happens. So the way we think about this is that, you know. Individuals are exposed to adversity and they have epigenetic changes. We think that these changes are changes that occur in a way to better adapt the, you know, the brain or the, the person you know, to deal with the environment. So adversity, it's very often perpetrated, you know, or so the abuse is perpetrated by caretakers, yes, commonly the parents. So uh, and the parents are not constantly uh, abusive. Are you know? So sometimes there are, sometimes not. Very many, many, many times the abuse occurs in the context of intoxication, the use of drugs, and um, so the message the brain gets it's basically a message where you know the environment. It's unpredictable. Uh, it's an environment where sometimes you have, you know, the same person who is there providing you care. It's, uh, you know, it it's provides and it's caring and other times it's abusive. So we think that the changes that occur are adaptive in that sense. There are changes um, that better help the brain deal with that unpredictability of the environment. So, you know, here you have this um, uh, illustrated. So on the right panel, you have what would happen in early life adversity, whereas on the left, what happens in normal development. So you know, normally we have a system that help us deal with stress known as the HPS system. HPA uh, axis. Uh, the HPA axis is activated, you know, when we are in a situation of stress, our adrenal cortex releases cortisol. Cortisol is the stress hormone that quickly, you know, primes our body to deal with the, with the stress. Um, and then there is a negative feedback in this area of the brain and in, in other areas as well, you know, but including in this area, uh, that suppresses these HP axis. And the way it works is that, you know, there are receptors for this cortisol that detect the levels of this cortisol and then suppress the activity so that we are not constantly being, you know, under activated and you know, overactivated. What, so what we think what happens, I told you that there are dif there's differences in methylation in individuals who were exposed to adversity early on in life. Uh, so what happens is that this increase in methylation leads to uh, decrease in the availability of the receptors. And by having less receptors, what happens is that there is a less efficient suppression of the HPA axis. And therefore, there is an overactivation of these HPA axis. So by overactivating this HPA axis, these individuals are more in a constant state you know, of alert, yes, that better prepare them to deal with an environment that is not predictable, yes, because in an environment that is not predictable is an environment that you never know, you know, when risk will happen, so you cannot, you know, relax, and, and we think that that's an adaptive mechanism that occurs in this individual. Now, in an environment where you know, they require to be constantly alert, this mechanism is very adaptive. 
you know, it helps them. But in a different environment, this become maladaptive, yes? And individuals from the clinical point of view that are constantly alert are actually individuals who have, um, who are uh, anxious, yes? Because being anxious, you know, it's basically a state where, you know, you're constantly alert and uh, your brain, you know, doesn't, uh, uh, doesn't relax. So, so that would be an example, you know, and I told you that one factor that mediates the relationship between early life adversity and suicide risk uh, is anxiousness. And we think that that's, for instance, one biological mechanism that could explain this relationship. All right. So I, uh, so these were examples of distal factors. Now, briefly, let's talk about proximal factors. You know, so the proximal factors are those that lead to, um, that precipitate a suicide a crisis. Yet, so obviously, life stressors are important. Yet, um, like, uh, you know, there's no specificity, uh, but, you know, life, you know, Issues like uh, losses, you know, relationship uh, losses, they're very common, important, uh, humiliating events, you know, public humiliations are also uh, common, as commonly associated with the suicide risk. Now, it's interesting because we talk a lot about, you know, uh, mental health during COVID and talk a lot about uh, uh, you know, concerns about suicide. But one of the things that we saw during the COVID pandemic was that suicide rates did not go up um, anywhere in the world, you know? And they actually went down in some places. Yet, so how can you explain that, uh, you know, this is a major source of social stress that we went through over the last three years, and yet suicide rates did not go up. And the reason for that, uh, I think, it's because um, we all collectively went through the same period of stress. And what it's important, or what is important, what it's often associated as a trigger to psychopathology, it's the individual experience, it's not the collective experience. When we all go through hardship, yet we have a tendency to get together and face, and that brings in a sense of belonging into a uh, common fight that we have, yet. So there are different mechanisms that are in place, which is very different when we alone are going through very, you know, a hard, a hard time. Uh, the, all, you know, the, but the most important factor, you know, in terms of uh, risk of suicide, it's really psychopathology. Yet, so psychopathology, in particular depression, it's present. Um, I don't have any slide here, but you know, about ninety percent of individuals who die by suicide have histories of psychopathology, and primarily depression. The uh, the other ten percent uh, probably also have you know we've done studies on this other ten percent probably also have histories of, of psychopathology but it's just that uh, we were uh, the way we detect and uh, the way we measure things the and because they were already dead it's very difficult for us to precisely assess that um, so. Uh, as I said, you know, major depression is the most common, followed by uh, problems related to uh, substance, uh, particularly, you know, in our environment, alcohol is very common, uh, and schizophrenia as well. Uh, so when we look at uh, rates of, or risk for suicide in individuals with uh, mood disorders, we'd see that Lifetime risk is about 7% for males and 25 for females. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, when you think about individuals who died by suicide, about 50% had histories of a past suicide attempt. But, you know, the other 50 did not. And in fact, when you look at the 
a distribution of suicide risk among individuals who have depression, you would see that most of the individuals who died early on in the course of the illness. Yet, so it's not a cumulative risk. In other words, not, you know, depression is an illness that often occurs by episodes, and it's not by having more episodes that people die by suicide, but they're more likely to die early on, and which is consistent with this idea that those that have that predisposition, you know, by having more impulsive aggressive traits, for instance, and other uh, factors like uh, problems with substance and uh, disinhibition, then are more likely to die early on in life. Okay, so, so that's about risk. Uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, before we conclude, uh, about what can we do on individuals who have risk? Uh, how can we intervene and, uh, and, and help, you know, decrease uh, risk or uh, uh, help people who have suicidal behavior? So, uh, so prevention, uh, there are three levels of intervention when, or three levels of strategies that we can use for prevention. Those that are universal, that are basically about decreasing factors that uh, are associated with suicide. Um, so for instance, you know, access to means like uh, drugs or uh, decreasing, uh, uh, you know, access to places where people can jump and uh, working with media and uh, awareness campaigns, etc. Then you have other ones that are more uh, selective to um, uh, certain groups that are at risk, like for instance, individuals who have depression. And then you have other ones that are more, uh, that we call indicated interventions that are more towards individuals that have manifested suicidal behavior. So for instance, interventions for uh, decreased uh, suicide risk in this with suicidal um, ideation or uh, crisis lines, et cetera, for individuals that have suicidal behavior. Uh, then you can screen, you know, by identifying people at risk in the general population or in, in uh, particular populations. Uh, and there are many different ways you can do that. Uh, certainly by promoting, promoting better diagnosis, uh, helping identify people at risk, uh, working with uh, GPs, for instance, and um, other health professionals uh, by identifying those that are more at risk or even asking about suicidal behavior because that's, uh, that's the first way to go. And uh, then how you intervene uh, by treating people that have suicidal behavior, so either pharmacologically or with uh, therapies or uh, social interventions. Now, the problem is that we, none of them are specific yet. So either pharmacological or psychosocial, we don't have interventions that really are specific to suicidal ideation and that would help us uh, decrease risk. So all of the interventions are, they focus on um, uh, the psychopathology that it's uh, that it underlies uh, suicide risk, and uh, so uh, I just want to you know before concluding just uh, get back to this model just to remind us all that suicide uh, it's it's a complex uh, behavior that results from the interaction of a number of different factors. Um, that are distantly, proximately uh, associated with psychopathology. So there's no single uh, intervention or prevention that would help us uh, address this. So we need to be mindful of uh, all of this complexity in number, you know, in a way to uh, intervene and help. 